الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفوته من خلقه وحبيبه قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وآمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا أما بعد We are following on the study of some of the laws and sunan by which our universe is managed and controlled and directed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manages all of this universe. And last time we explained part of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deals with us as communities, as societies, as groups. And we will continue to cover this because the Quran, alhamdulillah, is full of uh, ayat and examples. But we will now talk just about the ayat, which are the rules by which this universe is managed and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala treats us as societies, as humans, and as a community. Last time, we read portion of Surah Al-Isra'a in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us إِنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ يَهْدِي لِلَّتِي هِيَ أَقْوَمْ وَيُبَشِّرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ الصَّالِحَاتِ أَنَّ لَهُمْ أَجْرًا كَبِيرًا وَأَنَّ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ أَعْتَدْنَا لَهُمْ عَذَابًا أَلِيمًا We explain those two ayat 9 and 10 from Surah Al-Isra and today we are continuing because there are sunan that Allah deals with us also as individuals, one of which comes in ayah number 11. In ayah number 11, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَدْعُ الْإِنسَانُ بِالشَّرِّ دُعَاءَهُ بِالْخَيْرِ Man makes a dua for evil the same way with the same earnest desire to get what he's asking for, as if he is asking for something good. How many times do we ask for something or wish for something or pray for something and when it happens we discover it was not the right thing to do. It was not the good thing that we thought it would be. Whether it is a job, marriage, a car we buy, a house we rent or buy, we all make those wishes. When we like something, we earnestly want it. And we have the urge to pray earnestly to Allah and say, please, give me this. This is what I want. If you give me this, I will do this and this and this. So here is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explaining this phenomenon and telling us, be careful, do not ask for something specific. لا تطلبوا أعيان الأشياء Don't ask Allah Oh Allah, give me this car Ask Allah and say Oh Allah, I ask you to choose for me with your divine knowledge and wisdom because you know and I don't know You are capable over everything and I am capable over nothing So I ask you to choose for me what is good for me. Oh Allah, if you know that buying this car is good for me, for my living, for my fate in the hereafter, then give it to me and bless it for me. And if you know otherwise it's not good for my deen, for my dunya, for my hereafter, then take it away from me and give me what you see fit and Please my heart with it. This is called Dua al Istikhara. Allahumma inni astakhiruka bi ilmik wa astakhiruka bi kudratik fa inna kata alamu wala alam 
وتقدر ولا أقدر وأنت علام الغيوب اللهم إن كنت تعلم أن في أمر زواجي شرائي بيعي whatever you doing خيرا لي في ديني ودنياي وآخرتي وعاقبة أمري فيسره لي وب... ثم بارك لي فيه وإن كنت تعلم أنه شرا لي في ديني أو دنياي أو آخرتي أو عاقبة أمري فاصرفه عني واصرفني عنه You're asking Allah to keep your heart away from being hooked to that wish if it is not good for you. So this is how we ask Allah. Otherwise, we ask Allah for things that we think are good because that's we see things with our eyes and we appreciate it with our logic and we judge it by our knowledge which are all limited and Allah is telling us and the Prophet ﷺ is guiding us use dua al-istikhara when you ask don't ask Allah for something specific because you do not know what is good for you and this is the bottom line Wallahu ya'lamu wa antum la ta'lamun so this is one of the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is why many of us would pray and ask for something and would not get it. That's mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he doesn't give us all what we ask for. And he explains this in the Quran. He says, وَلَوْ يُعَجِّلُ اللَّهُ لِلنَّاسِ الشَّرَّ اسْتِعْجَالَهُمْ بِالْخَيْرِ لَقُضِيَ إِلَيْهِمْ أَجَلُهُمْ If Allah were to hasten all what people ask for, which could be evil, as they earnestly ask for what is good, and this is the reflection in this area here, then they would have been put to death. Their life would have been finished. Because we ask for things that can cause us death. We ask for things that can destroy what we have worked for for life. So we have to humble ourselves and only ask Allah to choose for us. Don't ask Allah to give you a place or something or a toy or anything that you like. Because what you like is not necessarily good for you and Allah has told us this maybe there is something you hate so much but it is good for you it is in your interest and maybe you like something so much but it is not good for you so for these reasons we learn from the Quran and from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that we should behave humbly and we should ask Allah to choose for us. Besides that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited us from extending a look of desire or lust to something we don't have. Because if you don't get it, you regret and you will be depressed, you will be sad, you will be sorry, you will keep lamenting the opportunity that was missed and all of this. Allah wants us to be free agents for His work. He wants us to be His and His alone. So when we earnestly want something, we forget that everything is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the one who gives, He is the one who keeps, he is the one who can take away what he gave. He is the one that can give you what you could not dream of. So he has everything in his hand. Trust him, ask him, but don't ask him to do things your way. Don't ask him because you love something or you love someone that you want her or him. Don't do that. Ask Allah to choose for you. And that is a confirmation that we as Muslims always believe that the choice Allah has for us is much better than our own choice. So, ayah number 12, وَجَعَلْنَا اللَّيْلَ وَالنَّهَارَ آيَتَيْنَ And we have made the night and the day as two signs, two miracles. And those miracles are explained extensively in the Qur'an. إِنَّ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ 
لآياتٍ لأولي الألباب. Thank you. So the the ayat of Layl and Nahar is not only about the daylight and the darkness of the night. We know that the day in the summer is long and the night is short. That also is an ayah. And that could be understood if Allah created the universe in this way, why would he make the day so long and the night so short? Most probably, we can read this in the Quran. Allah told us in Surah Anna, وَجَعَلْنَا اللَّيْلَ لِبَاسًا The night we have made it as a cover, time for rest and sleeping, recuperating your body, your heart rate, your distribution of the blood, your flat sleeping, all of these are factors to benefit from your sleep. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that the night is made for rest. What about the day? It is made for work. So when the night is short in the summer, it means we do not need to sleep longer than the night. You understand that when the night is long, like in the winter, it means that we need longer hours of sleep and shorter hours of work. Isn't those, isn't those things are signs from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the night dark because the day in the daylight we have lots of distractions. So in the night, Allah rests your eye because you don't see much. Allah rests your ears. The noise that we have in the daytime is not the same as at the night time. So what is this doing is it gives us time to free ourselves from the noise of the day, the distractions of the day, the suffering, the pain, the struggle, the trouble, the fights, and to rest. So the night should start with relieving ourselves, relieving ourselves from all the day pain and suffering and struggle with life and family and kids and bills and all of that. At night, the Prophet ﷺ, when he put his head on the pillow at night, he would read Surat Al-Ikhlas, Surat Al-Falaq, Surat Al-Nas, blow into his two hands and rub over his head and the rest of the body wherever his hands reach. He would also read Ayat Al-Kursi because those four pieces give you all what you need for the night. Provided that you relieve yourself from all the sins that you have done by the day so that when you sleep, you are ready to submit to Allah. If He calls you back, you are ready. So one has to never sleep when you have hurt or wronged somebody without fixing what you have done. Because if you go, you will take what you have done with you. It will be in your book, unless you fix it. So we have made the night and the day as two signs. فَمَحَوْنَا آيَةَ اللَّيْلِ We have made the night dark. There's little you could do. Even though the Quran in other places tells us that in the day and the night, you get the benefit of either working or resting. And this is a miraculous ayah that talks in a unique position in the Quran that talks about the day and the night as possible times for working or sleeping. Mind you, at the time the Quran was sent down, nobody could work at night. There's no light unless you put some fire, right? And you cannot travel with the fire, right? So people used not to travel at night, not to work at night, but to, to make us understand that Allah does not prohibit us from working at night if you have to, like people who work on night shifts and stuff like this, which are many today, by the blessing of Allah, blessing us with 
the gift of discovery of electricity and development of light means and other things. So the night is originally for rest and the medical establishment would tell us that the best time to have the deepest and most comfortable sleep that would achieve for you total rejuvenation of your body, soul, and mind is between midnight and before Fajr. That's the best time if you miss that night sleep of that part of the night, you will wake up with, with things that you don't want to do. So, وَجَعَلْنَا اللَّيْلَ وَالنَّهَارَ آيَتَيْنِ We have made the night and the day as two signs. فَمَحَوْنَا آيَةَ اللَّيْلِ وَجَعَلْنَا آيَةَ النَّهَارِ مُبْصِرَةً لِتَبْتَغُوا فَضْلًا مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَلِتَعْلَمُوا عَدَدَ السِّنِينَ وَالْحِسَابِ So that you can seek to earn your living in the daytime and so that you have the means to count السنين والحساب So by the cycle of the earth revolving around the sun we count the solar year and by the cycle of the moon around the earth we calculate this, uh, the lunar year this is what the Quran is saying so we have the means Allah did not leave us in the dark and did not leave us without knowledge and he is telling us use those natural lunar and solar phenomena to calculate the years and the time وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ فَسَّلْنَاهُ تَفْصِيلًا And everything, we have detailed it in complete way so that you don't need anything beyond what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent of guidance. What Allah has sent of guidance is two forms. The revelation of the Qur'an and the guidance and the wisdom He has given to the Prophet wasallam. Beyond those, every other knowledge is a tool for living in this life. But the, the, the means and the guidance to live a good life here and to get into a better life in the hereafter is the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. When Allah says, وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ فَصَّلْنَاهُ تَفْصِيلًا Or when He says, تِبْيَانًا وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ تِبْيَانًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ that absolute statement should never be stretched beyond what the revelation is about. The Quran is not, therefore, a book of chemistry. It is not a book of science, even though it has scientific miracles in it. And it has ayat that can point us to something like pointing us to fly in the air and so on and so forth, fly into the space. But still, the Qur'an is a book of guidance. So when it says, كل شيء, it means every piece of guidance we need as humans is right here. This is what it means. So one should never stretch and say, where does the Qur'an talk about uh, computers? The Qur'an, the computer is something, but the Qur'an doesn't talk about computer. What is computer? Computer is a means of calculation of things, right? And it follows that if you want to work with computer, you have to know math. If you want to develop some program, you have to know math as a background. So it goes under al-hisab, calculation, accounting. So it has a word, but it doesn't necessarily mean that particular application. But we have the intelligence and the tools to apply what we learn from the Quran in real life without making universal phenomenon fight with scientific phenomenon or religious revelation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent us guidance that should help us in every sphere of our life. Then it goes on to talk, ayah uh, number 13, about something that we all have to face. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from the day of judgment and its horrors. وَكُلَّ إِنسَانٍ أَلْزَمْنَاهُ طَائِرَهُ فِي عُنُقِهِ I want you to think about this. 
everyone has his amen. You know what amen is? Amen is something that makes you feel either optimistic or pessimistic. Okay? It's called amen, O M E N. So Allah SWT is saying, your amen is going to be hanged in your neck on the day of judgment. Your fate is registered in your book of deeds that you will receive hanging from your neck and open for you to read. And you would be told, read your book. كَفَى بِنَفْسِكَ الْيَوْمَ عَلَيْكَ حَسِيبًا I hope that we all take this ayah to heart. And every ayah of the Qur'an. This ayah is telling us, never do anything. Whether it is a word you want to say, a contract you want to sign, a relationship or business that you want to set up, or anything else, without accounting where in your record would you like this to be in your record of good deeds or on the other side of everybody's record. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our records always clear and always righteous and always pure. So this ayah is telling us, mind what you say, mind what you do. In a hadith, Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu arda asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when the Prophet advised him and told him should I tell you about what matters most, what controls everything? And Mu'a said, yes, tell me Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أمسك عليك هذا. And he held his tongue. Hold on your tongue to yourself. Leash your tongue. Mu'adh in amazement said, أَوَنَحْنُ مُؤَاخَذُونَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ بِمَا تَنْتِقُ بِهِ أَلْسِنَتُنَا we're talking right and left. Sometimes we're chatting, sometimes we are laughing, sometimes we are amusing each other or playing tricks on each other. And that's all talk. He says, فَكَلَتْكَ أُمُّكَ يَا مُعَاذ May your mother miss you to death. وَهَلْ يَكُبُّ النَّاسَ عَلَى مَنَاخِرِهِمْ فِي النَّارِ إِلَّا حَصَائِدُ أَلْسِنَتِهِمْ if there's something worse than the tongue of humans which puts them into hellfire on the day of judgment, the words we say matter, and they matter most and more than anything else. So when we speak, we should remember where in our book this word will go. Hence, the Prophet ﷺ warns us against false speech chatting or laughing or mocking the deen, which many of us do unintentionally. They don't mean to mock the deen, but they mock the deen. When they make jokes about death, jokes about angels, jokes even about Allah receiving someone who did this and the angels do this, all of these types of jokes are completely disrespectful of the deen disrespectful of Allah's revelation, disrespectful to his love of us, instead of appreciation, appreciating his guidance, we are playing with his guidance. So any laughter that you see anybody doing about prayer, about fasting, about any of the sharia of Allah is prohibited. It is prohibited to engage it, and it is prohibited if you do not stop it. And if you continue to listen to it, you are as sinful as the one who wants you to laugh at it. So in Surah At-Tawbah, the Quran summarizes this for us. The Munafiqeen, when blamed for what they were doing, mocking the religion, mocking the Prophet, mocking the Quran, they said, we were only playing, we were laughing, it's a matter of laughter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recorded it in the Quran and he said قُلْ أَبِ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَآيَاتِهِ كُنْتُمْ تَسْتَهْزِئُونَ قَدْ كَفَرْتُمْ بَعْدَ إِيمَانِكُمْ It's a kufr. 
it's a kufr to joke about Allah, his book, or any ayah, or any of his sharia. In Surah Al-Hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يُعَظِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ Anyone who shows high appreciation and respect for the sharia of Allah, the deen of Allah, the ahkam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is a sign of the taqwa in the heart. It shows your taqwa. So, اقرأ كتابك كفى بنفسك اليوم عليك حسيبا Your soul, yourself, is now enough of a witness against you. Can you believe this? The Quran tells us also that on the day of judgment, يوم تأتي كل نفس تجادل عن نفسها Every soul will be defending itself. You will be saying, no, I don't mean this. No, I didn't do this. But in front of Allah, nothing will be spoken of lies or falsehood. He will not allow in his presence anyone to fabricate a false excuse or use false logic. And the ayah of Surah At-Tawbah, it says, have you been mocking and joking about Allah, his messenger, and his ayat, you have committed blasphemy, kufr, after your faith. So please, if you have any of your friends or neighbors or relatives, anyone that uses religion to make jokes and laughter, tell them this is a blasphemy against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide our hearts and guide our actions to please him. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمد رسول الله One of the sunan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is coming in ayah number 15 من اهتدى فإنما يهتدي لنفسه ومن ضل فإنما يضل عليها ولا تزر وازرة وزر أخرى وما كنا معذبين حتى نبعث رسولا Anyone who follows the guidance of Allah he is following it for his own interest and anyone who goes astray against the guidance of Allah سبحانه وتعالى he is going astray against his own interest and against himself. And no sinning, no sinning soul will carry the sins of another sinning soul. No one will carry your mistakes. No one will be accountable for what you say or do. So the Quran is telling us, take responsibility. Take stock of what you say before you say it, not after. Before you do it, not after. Because stopping yourself is better than sinning deliberately and then making istighfar. Why? Because Allah yuhibbul muhsineen. If you want Allah to love you, hold yourself accountable before you do what is wrong. Make sure that when you speak, you have calculated and thought through what you want to say. Before you make talaq to your wife, think through it. Before you curse somebody, ask yourself, could Allah turn this around and my curse comes to me? Because it could happen. So we have to be careful. This life, the tongue is a weapon. And much or many of the wars that you witness right and left start with wars, with words. Almost all wars start with words. They say something here, they threaten here, they counter threat, then war starts. So on the individual level, you can have control over the wars you have at your home. 
you can stop all the wars by just holding on to your tongue. Hold on to your patience. Get your better self out. Don't let the shaitan keep pushing you until you do something wrong and then you think about how to fix it. Fix it by not doing it is better. وَلَا تَزِرُ وَازِرَةٌ وِزْرَ أُخْرَى No sinner will carry the sins of another sinner. وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا And we would never put to torment or punishment until we had sent a messenger. The messenger could be a person. The messenger could be a real messenger. And the messenger also could be you. When you work the mission of the Prophet and adapt it into your life to make da'wah, to command what is good and to stop what's evil, starting with yourself. And then those around you, the society will be always cleansed by this kind of effort. But if we succumb to our whims and desires, we are all losers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all winners. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt. وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وقنا واصرف عنا شر ما قضيت اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا وإذا أردت بقومنا فتنة فنجنا منها يا مولانا غير خزايا ولا مفتونين ولا مبدلين ولا مغيرين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاة